So actually, this is, I think, lecture 15. So we're exactly halfway through the course because a Lehman course meets 28 times. So 14 is the first half and 15 to 28 is the second half. And we're studying functions of two or three variables, functions of several variables in chapter 15. <laughs> and uh, let me just review um, partial derivatives and the chain rule. So the idea is to think of this as a nice generalization of what you learned in calculus one. In calc one, if you have a function, y equals f of x, and you take a point a, x equal to a, and on the curve, you have the point a comma f of a, then the derivative tells you the rate of increase of the function around the point a, or if you like the slope of the tangent line to the curve at a. And this tangent line, this is just the line passing through this point a f of a with slope, which is the derivative. So the tangent line is given by, just by the point slope formula, f prime of a x minus a plus f of a. And this is a very good linear approximation to your function. Near the point a, the value of f of x is very close to the point, the value of f of a on this line. So you have a linear approximation to your curve at every point. Now, suppose we have a function z of two variables. So we think of that as having a graph, which is some surface in three-dimensional space. And if you take a point, a, b in the x, y plane, so its coordinates are a, b, zero, if you like. Uh, if you look at the point on the surface, it has coordinates a, b, f of a, b. And you can ask, what is the analog of the derivative of the function of one variables in the case when you have a function of two variables? And what is the analog of the tangent line to a curve when you have a surface? And what we're going to see is there's not just one analog of the derivative, uh, but in every direction from at the point A, B, you can take a derivative in, in, in each direction. And the analog of the tangent line is going to be a plane in space, which approximates the function at a point. And this plane is something we, which is called the tangent plane. So this is a planar approximation or a two-dimensional approximation to the surface. So just like for a curve, the tangent line approximates the function at a point. For a surface, the tangent plane approximates the surface at a point. And we need to learn how to find the equation of the tangent plane. Um, I just want to remember to recall um, how you actually find the equation of a plane. So in three-dimensional space, Suppose you take a point, I'll say its coordinates are A, B, and C. And I want to find the plane. Now, one way to describe a plane is to say, okay, it's all points. A, it's all points where if you draw the, take a point X, Y, Z, and you look at the vector from A, B, C to X, Y, Z, it's all points which are perpendicular to some specified vector. So suppose I have this vector, I'll call it, um, <clears throat> not sure what to call it actually. Um, 
um, some vector v uh, with coordinates um, x naught, y naught, z naught. I'm not sure that's the best choice of letters, but um, what does it mean to say that the vector from a, b, c to x, y, z is perpendicular to this? It means that the inner product is zero, right? Two vectors are perpendicular when their dot product or uh, dot product is zero. So, <clears throat> so there's the vector, I should put it like this, the vector from here to here is the vector whose coordinates are um, x naught minus a, y naught minus a. Um, yeah. Let me just call it x naught, y naught, that's this vector. And the, the vector from a, b, c to x, y, z, that vector has coordinates x minus a, y minus b, z minus c. And we want that to be perpendicular to this vector, which means the dot product is zero. So the dot product of this vector and this vector is x naught times x minus a plus y naught times y minus b plus z naught times <coughs> z minus c. That has to equal zero. Um, that's the equation <coughs> of the plane <coughs> through the point a, b, c perpendicular to this vector. I mean, in general, you know, the equation of a plane um, is uh, ax plus by plus cz equal d. That always gives you the, a plane in three-dimensional space. Uh, and if you want to find the plane <coughs> through a point perpendicular to a given vector, it's given by this formula. So <coughs> we're going to see that. Uh, when it comes to constructing the tangent plane, but I just want to remind you that knowing the equation of a plane is very important. Okay. Any questions about that? All right. Now, <clears throat> if we have a function of two variables, say z equals f of x, y, we define the partial derivatives which is sometimes written partial of f with respect to x or d sub x of f, they're the same thing, or the partial of f with respect to y or d sub y of f. <coughs> and these are <coughs> the derivatives in the direction of the x and y axes. So if you take a point, uh, let's say a, b, um, well, let's say x, y, the partial of f with respect to x at the point x, y. This means you look at f of x plus h1 comma y minus f of x, y divided by h1. And you take the limit as h1 goes to zero. So it's hard for me to draw pictures of things, but these are the x and y axes and this is the surface. Here is my point. Maybe I should call this a, b to make it a little bit clearer, a, b. So here in the plane is the point a, b. This is the point on the surface. And if I change the point a, b only by moving in the x direction, so this would be a plus h1 comma b. And if I fix b, my function is really just a function of the first coordinate. And so I can just take the ordinary derivative in the x direction, that's this limit as h1 goes to zero. And if that limit exists, that's the partial of f with respect to x. If I were to take this point and move in a direction parallel to the y-axis, a doesn't change. And we increase b by some amount h2. And the partial of f with respect to y at the point a, b, we look at the change in the value of the function from here to here. That's f of a b plus h2 minus f of a b divided by h2. And take the limit of that as h2 goes to zero. That's the partial derivative. And 
we've seen lots of um, simple examples. I mean, so for example, if if you have the function z equal to x squared minus 3y squared plus 20, if you take the partial of this with respect to x, and you're differentiating with respect to x, y is constant, this is constant. The derivative of all this is constant, we just get 2x. The partial of z with respect to y would be minus 6y, and so on. So we already looked at partial derivatives, and this is just what the partial derivatives are. Now, what's more interesting is what happens when you have a composite function and you want to calculate partial derivatives. So for that, we need the chain rule. So I re remind you of the chain rule from ordinary calculus. If you have um, a function f from the reals to the reals, or some subset of it, and a function g from reals to reals, or if you compose them, you get the function f composed with g. And the chain rule for a function of one variable says the derivative with respect to x of f composed with g is f prime evaluated at g of x, g prime of x. So if f of x were x squared and g of x were, I don't know, sine of x, then f composed with g at x would be the sine of x squared and the derivative of f composed with g would be f prime of g of x, g prime of x f prime of x is x is 2x. So f prime at g of x would be 2 g of x. g prime of x is the cosine times the cosine. g of x is sine, so this is 2 sine x cosine x. That's the chain rule. And for us, what we have to figure out is how to deal with the chain rule in functions of several variables. So there are uh, two basic cases. So you can think of it like this. Um, you have a map from R2 to R. So this is some function f or f of x, y. But it could be that x and y are both functions of, or let's call this, uh, it could be that x is some function of t and y is some function of t. So we have a map from r into r into the plane where the number t gets sent to the number x of t, y of t, right? So you have two functions of t and for any t you have a point in the plane x of t, y of t. And then you apply f to that and you get f of x of t, y of t. So if you look at the composite, this is t gets sent to t. This is just a number. And we can ask, what is df dt? That's just the derivative of a function of one variable. But of course, it's more complicated because my function is really the composite of a function of two variables with two functions of one variable. And so, and what I want to do is somehow express this in terms of the partial derivatives of f and the derivatives of x and y. So the chain rule says, in this case, this is the partial of f with respect to x, dx dt, plus the partial of f with respect to y, dy dt. Um, that's the chain rule. When f is a function of two variables and x and y are each functions of one variable. And there is a way to um, think about this. If you had partial of f with respect to x 
partial of f with respect to y. And dx dt anyway like this imagine you had a vector partial of f with respect to x partial of f with respect to y and another vector dx dt dy dt if you take the dot product of these two vectors, this is exactly what you get. And this, is this times this plus this times this. That's the chain rule. So for example, if we had, uh, again, the function, Z equals X squared minus three Y squared plus 20. So this is an example. I'm taking this from the book. So it's easier to follow when you're studying at home. If Z is this function of two variables and let's say X and Y are functions of one variable, X is two cosine T and Y is two sine T. This is my function, the partial of f or z, uh, call this f of x, y. But the partial of f with respect to x is 2x. Partial of f with respect to y is minus 6y. Partial of x with respect to t is minus 2 sine t. Partial of y with respect to t is 2 cosine t. So if I multiply this times this plus this times this, I get that df dt is minus 4x sine t minus 12 y cosine t. And X and Y are given by these. So I can plug in what the values for X and Y. X is two cosine T. So this is minus eight cosine T sine T. Y is two oh. sine T. So 12 times that is minus 24 cosine T sine T. And right. I get minus 32 cosine T sine T. So that's an example of the chain rule when you have a function, z is a function of x and y, and x and y are each functions of some variable t. Professor? Yes. Uh, what do you get for minus 3y squared? When I take the partial with respect to y, I get minus 6y. Okay, I got it. Minus. And turning is constant, right? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. The second case, which is a little more complicated, is when you have a function of two variables, and each of those two variables, x and y, is a function of two other variables. So in that case, you might have you have the following situation. You have z or f of x, y, this z is some function of x and y, and x is some function of two variables that say s and t, and y is a function of s and t. So I can start with a point st. That gives me a point in the another point in the plane, x of st comma y of st and then i apply z and i get f of x of st y of st so this composite function i'll call it capital f for the moment it's really some function of s and t because you start with a variable st a point st and you end up with some number which is 
complicated, but it's really just a function of S and T. And we want to figure out what is the partial of F with respect to S and what is the partial of F with respect to T. This is a function of two variables. What is their partial derivative? So I have uh, a sneaky way to remember this and you can think of this way or not, it doesn't matter, but ultimately you have to know the formula. So um, I do have um, for my function f, I have the partial of f with respect to x and the partial of f with respect to y. And I also have the partial of x with respect to um, s and the partial of x with respect to t and the partial of y with respect to s and the partial of y with respect to t. So for f, I have partial derivatives with respect to x and y. For x, I have partial derivatives with respect to s and t. And for y, I have partial derivatives for, with respect to s and t. Now, if you happen to know what a matrix is, and if you don't, it doesn't matter, but if you happen to know what a matrix is, if I just do matrix multiplication, what do I get? I get partial of f with respect to x, partial x, partial s, plus partial f with respect to y, partial y, partial s. And the second coordinate is partial f with respect to x, partial y with respect to s, plus partial of f with respect to y, partial y, oops, let's see, uh, sorry, partial f with respect to x, partial x with respect to t, plus partial f with respect to y, partial y with respect to t. So I have this column vector, something here and something here, and what is in the numerator, what is in the top is in fact the partial of f with respect to s, and this is the partial of f with respect to t. So you can get these formulas by matrix multiplication, but you don't have to know matrix multiplication. The book doesn't assume that you do. The book simply tells you the answer. The book tells you that the partial of f with respect to s is the partial of f with respect to x, partial x with respect to s, plus partial of f with respect to y, partial y with respect to s. That's this. And the partial of f with respect to t is the partial of f with respect to x, partial x, partial t, plus partial f, partial y, partial y, partial t. So these are the two formulas. This is the chain rule for a function of two variables where each variable is itself a function of two variables. And let's just do an example of this. Uh, Professor. Yes. So you can use any of the well, any of the formula, right? Sorry? You can use any of the formula for the chain rule. Well, I'm not going to ask you to prove this. In fact, I'm not proving it at all. These are the chain rules. <clears throat> so <clears throat> which you have to know. One way to remember it if you're if you know and like matrices is from this, but that's really irrelevant. <clears throat> One way or another, this is what you have to know. Okay. Thanks. So, So let's just do an example. Try to keep the formula there. So
suppose z is x plus 2y to the 10th. And x is sine squared t, and y is 3t plus 4 to the fifth. <clears throat> so this is the first case where z is a function of two variables, x and y, but each of x and y is a function of just one variable, t, and we just want to find the derivative z d dz dt. So this is the partial of z with respect to x, <clears throat> dx dt, plus the partial of z with respect to y, dy dt. Partial of z with respect to x is 10 <clears throat> x plus 2y to the ninth. dx dt is 2 sine t cosine t. Plus the partial of z with respect to y, which is 10 x plus 2y to the 10th times 2 times dy dt. This is 3t plus 4 to the fifth. So when I differentiate that, I get 5, 3t plus 4 to the fourth times the derivative of 3t plus 4, which is 3. So I get some sort of messy looking expression, which looks like 20, this should be a 9, 20 x plus 2y to the ninth sine t cosine t Oops, let's see plus 2 times 10 is 20 times 5 is 100 times 3 plus 300 x plus 2y to the ninth 3t plus 4 to the fourth. And if I really wanted everything in terms of t, I would substitute x equals sine squared t here and y equals this and so forth. And I would end up with an expression in terms of t. Okay. What about the case where you have a function of x and y and each of x and y is a function of s and t. So suppose we have, for example, z is x squared sine y, where x is s minus t, and y is t squared. So we have the partial of z with respect to s is the partial of z with respect to x, partial of x with respect to s, plus the partial of z with respect to y, partial of y with respect to s. When I differentiate z with respect to x, I get 2x sine y, partial of x with respect to s is 1. Partial of z with respect to y is x squared cosine y, partial of y with respect to s is 0. So I simply have 2x sine y, which is 2s minus t times the sine of t squared. Okay, so that's the partial of z with respect to s. And I would calculate the partial of z with respect to t similarly. I'm looking at the problems at the end of this section. So I think this is number 19. This was number 13. Let's look at a problem where we solve the same problem, but in two different ways. So this is Problem 29, we have z 
is one over x plus one over y. So this is a function of two variables where x is t squared plus two t and y is t cubed minus t. Now, if I just, so let me solve this in. So this is method one. This is not using the chain rule. I just substitute these in. So z is one over t squared plus two t plus one over y, which is t cubed minus t. And I can just differentiate this just the way we learned to do in calc one. dz dt, this is t squared plus two t to the minus one. So it's minus t squared plus two t to the minus two times the derivative of two squared t squared plus two t, which is two t plus two, plus the derivative of t cubed minus two to the minus one, which is minus t cubed minus two to the minus two times the derivative of t cubed minus two, which is three t squared. So I get minus two t plus two over t squared plus two t squared minus three t squared over t cubed minus two squared. So this is just using freshman calculus, calc one, right? So that's method one, sort of direct substitution. Method two will be the chain rule. Chain rule will say dz dt is partial z with respect to x dx dt plus the partial of z with respect to y dy dt. Partial of z with respect to x is minus one over x squared. Partial of x with respect to t is two t plus two. Partial of z with respect to y is minus one over y squared dy dt is three t squared. So I get minus two t plus two over x squared minus three t squared over t cubed minus t squared. And you'll notice these are exactly the same. So everything works out. All right, now, when we look at this process of finding the partial with respect to X and the partial with respect to Y, it's like here we have x, y, and here is our surface, z equal f of x, y. And we're taking a point a, b in the x, y plane. And when we take the partial with respect to x, we're looking at the rate of change of the function as you move parallel to the x-axis. And when you take the rate of the partial with respect to y, you're looking at the rate of change of the function when you're moving parallel to the y-axis. But it's completely reasonable to ask, at what rate does this function change if you move in the direction of some arbitrary, let's say unit vector u1, u2. So u1, u2, it's going to be a unit vector, a vector of length one. <clears throat> so certainly not zero. And we would like to know when we move in this direction, how does, at what rate does this function change? So the natural way to define this would be the following. So think of this, here we have this point A, B in the X, Y plane, we take a unit vector U with coordinates U1, U2. So this would be A plus U1 comma B plus U2. And we would wanna know what is F of A plus U1, B plus, sorry, 
that's the direction, but we want to go a certain amount. So let's call it H. A plus HU1, A plus HU2. And if we take, if the U is U1, U2, and the length is equal to one, then if I take H U1, H1, U1, H2, U2, H is going to be the length of that vector. So, um, so let me sort of draw a picture of this, um, a better picture. So here is A, B, and here is A plus H, U, 1, H, 1, U, 1, A plus, uh, actually it has to be the same H, A plus H, U, 1, a plus HU2. So this vector has coordinates HU1, HU2. And the length of that vector is just the absolute value of H times the length of U, which is just the absolute value of H because this is a unit vector. So if I look at A plus HU1, B plus HU2 minus F of AB, and I divide that by H, and I take the limit of that as H goes to zero, if it exists, this is what I would call the directional derivative d in the direction u of the function f at the point a, b. So it's the rate at which the function is changing as you move along a line through a, b in the direction of or parallel to the unit vector u. Right. So again, this is what we talked about on Monday. and. That's what we have to understand. So the question is how, how do we calculate that? So we can actually use the chain rule to calculate this because I have a function f of x, y and as you move along a line, this is the vector u, this line, this line is parametrized by a point on this line would be x, y equals h, I'll call the variable s, s u one, s u2. So if this is u, this is the variable s times u, it's just s u1, s u2. So I can look at f as a composite function. f is a function of x and y, but on this line, x of s is s u1, and y of s is s u2. And if I want to find <clears throat> I want to find the derivative along this line. So I want to find df ds, which by the chain rule is the partial of f with respect to x, partial x with respect to s, plus partial of f with respect to y, partial y with respect to s, or dy ds. This is, again, it's just the formula I come up with in the end, but I'm just showing you how you derive it. This is the partial of f with respect to x, dx ds is u1. Partial of f with respect to y, dy ds is u2. So that's the directional derivative. So if we have a vector u equal to u1, u2, the directional derivative of f of f in the direction u at any point a, B is going to be equal to the partial of F with respect to X at A, B times U1 plus the partial of F with respect to Y at A, B times U2. This is 
the dot product of the vector partial of f with respect to x at a b partial of f with respect to x partial of f with respect to y at a b dot product with u1 u2 of course this is just the vector u and this vector we give a name we write an upside down capital delta this is delta f at a b and this is called the gradient of f at the point a b so the gradient of f at the point a b is the vector whose coordinates are the partial of f with respect to x and the partial of f with respect to y and we've just derived a very simple formula for finding the directional derivative of f in the direction of any unit vector u u has to be a unit vector if you can't you can't use this formula if the if the length of u is different from one um, but if the if you have a unit vector and you want the directional derivative in that direction is simply the dot product of the gradient of the function with the vector which is a remarkable thing so for example suppose we have the function f of x y equal to a fourth x squared plus y squared plus two or let me just follow the example in the book a half a fourth x squared plus two y squared plus two and we take the unit vector one over root two one over root two right so this is a unit vector that makes an angle of pi over four with the positive x-axis that's my unit vector and these are its coordinates and the length of this vector is one so the directional derivative so and what is the gradient of f the partial derivative with respect to x is a fourth times 2x which is x over 2 the partial derivative with respect to y is a fourth times 4y which is y so this is the gradient so the directional derivative of f in the direction u at any point xy is going to be the dot product of x over 2 and y with the vector u and this is the vector u one over root two one over root two so we get x over two root two y over root two and at a particular point let's say three halves three comma two this is equal to three over two root two two over root two which if you like you can write as three root two over four comma root two but it doesn't matter but that's what it is I'm oh, sorry uh dot product it's this plus this it's the dot product this plus this plus this so this is three fourths root two plus root two is seven fourths root two it's a number that's the directional derivative now the formula for the directional derivative gives us a very important interpretation of the gradient so we have a function z equal f of x y the gradient of f at x y it's a vector partial of f with respect to x let's say at a b at a b and the second coordinate is the partial of f with respect to y at a b suppose we take a unit vector u1 u2 
then the directional derivative of f in the direction of u at a b is the gradient of f at a b dot product with u. Now, what we know about the dot product, just to remind you, if I have two vectors v and w and I take their dot product, this is the length of v, the length of w times the cosine of theta where theta is the angle between them. And cosine of theta varies between plus one and minus one. So if we ask in what direction does the function f increase most rapidly? That means in what direction is this directional derivative as large as possible? Well, the directional derivative, it's given by this formula, which means it's the length of the vector of the gradient at AB times the length of the vector U times the cosine of the angle between them. But u is a unit factor. This is equal to one in length. So this is the gradient of f at a, b times the cosine of theta. This is maximum when this is equal to one. So this is the maximum when cosine theta equals one, which means when theta is equal to zero. When theta is equal to zero, that means u is a vector parallel to or points in the direction of the gradient. So the gradient of a function is a vector, which if it's non-zero, is pointing in the direction of maximum increase of the function. And the minimum occurs when this is as small as possible. The smallest possible is when theta is minus one, which means that the angle between the gradient and the vector u is pi when they point in opposite directions. So if you have a function of two variables and you're interested in how it change in what directions at what rate it changes in different directions at the point a b is increasing most rapidly when the unit vector is pointing in the direction of the gradient and it's decreasing most rapidly when the unit factor is points in the direction of minus the gradient. And I should also make one other comment. This equals zero when theta is plus or minus pi over two. So, the rate of change of the directional derivative is zero in the direction, in any direction perpendicular to the gradient. When this angle between the unit vector and the gradient is pi over two, the cosine is zero and the, the directional derivative has its value zero. So that is for us a useful observation. So there really is a great deal of mathematics in what we are talking about today, and we've hardly finished, but you really need to spend a lot of time studying the book, studying the pictures in the book, and doing as many exercises as you can, whether or not they are uh, uh, homework or not. Just the more you do, the better you understand what's happening. So again, if 
the gradient. So if u, the vector u is a unit vector, perpendicular or orthogonal means the same thing, orthogonal, perpendicular. If u is a unit vector orthogonal to the gradient of f at the point a, b, then the derivative of f in the direction of u at a, b is zero. Because the angle between the gradient and the, and the vector u is pi over two. What is a level curve of a function? A level curve z of, of z equals f of x, y is the set of points x, y, where f of x, y takes on some fixed value c. So for example, if you had a paraboloid, something which looked like this, right? Like a parabola rotated around the a level curve would be a circle. It's everything which is height c above the xy plane, and it cuts this paraboloid in a circle. So <clears throat> for a paraboloid like this, a level curve is a circle um, in parallel to the xy plane. or say f of x, y equals z naught. So all the points x, y, where f of x, y is some constant value c naught, that's a level curve of your surface. And on a level curve, the value of the function doesn't change. So if r of t is some curve, x of t comma y of t, that lies in a level curve, then f at r of t takes on this fixed value, the level curve, f equals z naught, f of r of t is constant. Which means that df dt is zero because this is a constant function. But the f dt, if you think of r of t as x of t, y of t, this is the partial of f with respect to x, dx dt, plus the partial of f with respect to y, dy dt. That's the dot product of the gradient with dx dt comma dy dt. which is exactly the definition of r prime of t, the tangent vector to the curve, and that's zero. So <clears throat> this proves the statement in the text. This is theorem 512. It says, given a function f, which is differentiable at a, b, the line tangent to the level curve of any line, the line tangent to the level curve of f at AB is orthogonal to the gradient. That is, if you take any curve R of t in this level curve, then the composite function is constant, so the derivative is zero. And by the chain rule, that derivative is the gradient of f times the tangent vector to the curve at any point. 
So the gradient is perpendicular to the tangent factor of any curve inside the level, drawn in the level curve. The line tangents of the level curve of F is orthogonal to the gradient. So there's another way of expressing this, which the book describes uh, following theorem 5.2. So we have Z equals F of X, Y. That's some surface in the plane, sorry, some surface in three-dimensional space. And let's say you have a level curve, F of X, Y equals Z naught. And you take a point on that level curve. And on this curve, you might have, you will have a tangent vector, tangent line. So the line tangent to the level curve at the point AB is orthogonal to the gradient of F at AB. So this is the point AB Z naught above the point A, B in the plane. So we have a function F of X, Y. A, B in the plane gets mapped to some point above it on the surface, A, B comma F of A, B. And if, if this is the level surface, Z naught, F of A, B is equal to Z naught. And if you take a point on this line, X, Y, let's see. Um, So f of x, y equals z naught, that's the level curve. And if I take a point x, y that lies on that level curve, this vector from a, b to x, y is x minus a, y minus b. And I want that to be perpendicular, perpendicular, to the gradient at a, b, which is f sub x, partial of f with respect to x at a, b, partial of f with respect to y at a, b. And if these two vectors are perpendicular, the dot product is zero. So f sub x of a, b times x minus a plus f sub y of a, b, y minus b is zero. And this is another expression for the tangent line to the curve f of x, y equals z naught at a, b. So I guess the way to look at this is the following. We have z equals f of x, y. And in the x, y plane, we have all the points where f of x, y equals this constant z naught. So this is some curve in the x, y plane. And if you take a point A, B on that curve, at that point, the derivative of F
that is the gradient is perpendicular to, so let's see. So we take the tangent line at this point, take a point on that tangent line x, y, this vector is perpendicular to the gradient that gives this expression. So I'm not sure that I'm expressing this very clearly, um, but it is as clearly expressed as the textbook, certainly. And this just gives an alternate way to describe the tangent line to a curve at a, at a point where the curve is the level curve of a function. Let me just try and explain this one more time, maybe make it a little bit clearer. So we have a function of two variables. Z is f of x and y. And we have a level curve. That's all the points where f of x, y takes on some fixed value z naught. So in the x, y plane, that's some curve. It's all the points which satisfy that. And at a point, so let's say that AB lies on this curve. So F of AB is equal to Z naught. And At this point AB on the curve, there's a tangent line. That's the tangent line. And suppose XY lies on that tangent line. And I want to find an equation for the tangent line to this level curve. So suppose this curve is parametrized by r of t equals x of t comma y of t, right? So as t varies through some interval of the real numbers, you're going along this, this curve. And if I look at, um, so f of r of t, that is, always equal to z naught, it's constant. So if I take, this is a function of t, df dt, I know that's zero. But by the chain rule, f is a function of two variables, and e x, but x and y are both functions of t. So this is the partial of f with respect to x at a, b, dx dt, plus the partial of f with respect to y, dy dt, and that's zero. That's the dot product of the gradient of f at a, b, dot product with dx dt, dy dt, which is by definition the derivative of the tangent vector at the point a, b, at point t, where t is equal to a, b. So the tangent vector r prime of t is orthogonal perpendicular to the gradient of f. So if I take any point on that tangent line, the vector from a, b to that point is going to be perpendicular to the gradient. That means that the gradient of f at a, b, dot product with the vector x minus a, y minus b is zero. And this is the partial of f with respect to x at a, b times x minus a, plus the partial of f with respect to y at a, b times y minus b. So, why, so I have another equation of the tangent line to the curve. So let's see if I can work out an example of this uh, just to make sure we can do the calculations.
So this is my formula for the tangent line. Suppose we have the function z equal f of x y, which is this somewhat complicated function, square root of one plus two x squared plus y squared. What is the gradient of f? Well, let's calculate the partial derivatives. The partial of f with respect to x, this is one plus two x squared plus y squared to the one half. So it's one half, one plus two x plus y squared to the minus one half times the derivative of this with respect to x, which is four x. So this is two x over the square root of one plus two x squared plus y squared. Partial of f with respect to y is one half, one plus two x squared plus y squared to the minus one half times the derivative of this with respect to y, which is two y. So we get y over square root of one plus two x squared plus y squared. And the gradient, so the gradient of f at any point a, b is the partial of f with respect to x at a, b, comma partial of f with respect to y at a, b that vector. So the gradient of f at the point one comma one is equal to what? When x and y are one, I get two. So in the denominator is one plus two plus one is square root of four is two. So partial of f with respect to x is two x over two, it's just x. And when x is equal to one, that's equal to one. Again, this is equal to two when y is one, this is a half. So the gradient of this function at the point one, one is equal to one comma one. The value of f at one comma one is the square root of one plus two times one squared plus one, which is the square root of four, which is two. So I can look at the level curve f of x, y equal two. It's all the points in the plane where f of x, y is equal to two. What are those points? Um, what is the level curve? f of x, y, which is two, that's the square root of one plus two x squared plus y squared. If I square both sides, I get four equals one plus two x squared plus y squared, or two x squared plus y squared equals three. That's an ellipse, right? x squared, sorry, x squared over three halves, plus y squared over three equal one. That's just an ellipse. This is the square root of three. This is the square root of three halves. Right? So this level curve is an ellipse. And on that ellipse is the point one, one, because two plus one is three. Oops, just one second. So, <clears throat> At the point one, one for my function, f of x, y is equal to two. And if I solve to see what the level curve is for z equal to two, it's this ellipse. Nice ellipse that looks like that. The point one, one is on the ellipse. And the gradient of f at the point one is one comma, a half. What is the slope of the tangent at this point? If we have two x squared plus y squared equals three, by implicit differentiation, we get, when we differentiate with respect to x, we get 
2 times 2x, 4x, plus 2y, y prime equals 0. So 2y, y prime equals 4x, so equals minus 4x. So y prime is 2x over y. Oops. Um, is that right? 4x plus 2y, y prime equals 0. So 2y, y prime is minus 4x. So y prime is minus 2x over y. So at this point, the tangent line, so at x equal y equals 1, y prime is minus 2. Slope of the tangent line is minus 2. And the gradient, what was the gradient? The gradient was 1, comma, a half. This line, 1, comma, a half, has slope, minus, has slope a half. So this gradient has slope a half, and minus 2 times a half is minus 1. Two lines have slopes, which is one is the negative reciprocal of the other, then they're perpendicular. What is the equation of the tangent line? The equation of the tangent line is Here was the formula, partial of f with respect to x. So the partial of f with respect to x at 1, 1, well, say the gradient was 1. This is 1, and this is a half. And this is x minus 1, and this is x minus 1 equals 0. That means x, sorry, y, plus a half y equals minus one minus a half equals three halves, or two x plus y equals three. So, oops. One half, the partial, the gradient was a half. Two x plus y equal three. That's exactly correct. Anyway, um, you really need to study this section of the book very carefully. There's, uh, I mean, I can cover it in a lecture, but the only way to understand it is to go through the text and work through the examples um, very, very, very carefully. This is example six on page nine sixty eight, and. Um, you really need to try to understand this uh, and to work problems and on Monday to ask me whatever questions you might have. Okay. okay. Any, so we actually covered a lot of hard material today, but uh, vector calculus is a hard class. Any questions before we end? Um, professor. Um... Yes. What's it for the test, right? Do we need to like um, draw any graphs or like any like objects in a plane for the answers or it will just strictly be um, solving on um, the equations and stuff like it's that? It's going to be solving the equations, but very often to solve a problem, it's helpful if you yourself can sketch a picture of what's going on, but that won't be part of the required answer. You just have to solve the problems. Okay. Thank you, Professor. And um. What's it? So um, next week you said we're going to get the study guide. Does that mean that next Thursday we'll review it and like have like a final review before the test? You mean next next Wednesday. Oh yeah, next Wednesday. I mean yeah. Oh uh, yes, I'll go over everything on the study guide next week. All right. Thank you, Professor. Sure. Okay. Bye, everyone. <laughs>